Chapter Twenty Two of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Two: A Race for Life. Kate had walked away without a thought of attempting to gather the subject of her uncle's conversation with Redmore. She resolved at once to seek her father and obtain from him permission to house the unfortunate wife with her children in his cottage. She had been told that he had gone to a farm lying somewhat to the right of the Ashburton Road, near the prominent and stately rock citadel of Sharpator. She therefore ascended the long, steep hill, up which scrambles the high road from Dartmeet. Halfway up the ascent is an oblong mass of granite, lying in the moor, which goes by the name of Coffin Stone, because on it coffins are rested by those who are bearing a corpse to its last resting place in the distant churchyards at Buckland or Ashburton. Kate had reached this stone, and was panting for breath, when she heard shouts and cries in the valley she was leaving, and, leaping upon the coffin stone, she saw a swarm of men on the opposite bank of the dart, the brimp's side, running in the direction of the bridge, headed by her uncle, who was then leveling a gun he carried. From her elevation she could not only see, but hear everything. An incendiary, he set fire to a stack, a pound to any man who takes him, alive or dead, shouted Pasco, and to Kate every word was audible. Then she saw the flash of the gun, and a little later heard the report. The shot had missed, for her uncle urged on the men to run and not let the scoundrel escape, and he himself lagged behind to reload his barrel. She looked for the fugitive, but was able to see him for one moment only, as he leaped a ruinous fence in his flight downstream. But why was he taking that direction? Because the way into the fastness of the moorland was closed to him by his pursuers. He could not run up the hill that Kate ascended, as he would be exposed throughout, without the smallest cover, to the gun of Pepperill. Though a course down the river led ultimately into inhabited land, yet between the moor and population lay the great woodland belt of Buckland and Holm Chase, where the river wound its way in sweeps among dense forest and rock, and where Redmore knew he could hide with the greatest ease. But before he could be in the woodland he had a long stretch of moor to traverse, and there was no road, at best a fisherman's track, among rocks scattered in confusion, among heather and furze bushes, and here and there slow and thorn trees, and an occasional witch beam or rowan growing out of the rocks. Almost immediately after the junction of the east and the west dart, the united stream doubles round Sharpator, that shoots high above it on one side, and under the ridges of Benjator on the other side, in whose lap grows a little copse, and which, from its crags to the water's edge, is green with bracken in summer but at this period was russet with withered leaves. Thence smoke rose. Some boys had ignited the gorse, and the flames ran among the withered ferns and the fallen oak leaves, and blackened and burnt the copse. Kate hastened on her way. She knew that on reaching the head of the ridge a short distance intervened between the road and the precipices of Sharpator that overhung the ravine. Thence she could see all that followed, if Roger Redmore succeeded in turning the moorland spur, round which the river foamed. Hot, trembling, and breathless, Kate ran, then halted to gasp, then ran on, and did not rest for more than a minute till she had reached the vantage point on the rocks, and looked down into a wondrous ravine of river, granite boulder, and glaring golden firs, and with the blue smoke of the smoldering fern, forming a haze that hung in its depths, but which rose in places above the rocky crests of the moor and showed brown against the luminous sky. Kate ensconced herself among the piles of granite, with a clatter, as it is locally termed, at her feet, a mass of rocky ruin, composed of granite, in fragments of every size and in various conditions of disintegration. She saw Redmore as he doubled the foot of the mountain, and for a while had the advantage of being invisible to his pursuers, and safe from the gun of Pepperell. He stood on a great rock, halfway out of the water, and looked about him. He was resolving what to do, 
whether to continue his course downstream or to endeavor to conceal himself at once. The fire and smoke on the farther side of the bosom of Bajitor made it impossible for him to secrete himself there. Every lurking place was scorched or menaced by the flames. The slope of Sharpator on his left, though strewn with the wreckage of the crags above, offered no safe refuge. It was exposed to full light, without any bushes in it other than the hortle and heather. Roger did not take long to make up his mind. He pursued his course down the river, now wading, then scrambling over stones, then leaping from rock to rock, and then again flying over a tract of smooth turf. Occasionally the wind, playing with the smoke, carried a curl of it across the river, and he drew it out and shook it as a veil, obscuring Redmore from the eyes of Kate, who watched him in panting unrest, and with prayers for his safety welling up in her heart. Then shouts. The men who hunted him had rounded the flank of Sharpator, and had caught sight of the man they were endeavoring to catch. One fellow, with very long legs, familiar with the ground, accustomed all his life to the moor, was making great way, and bade fair to catch Roger. Redmore looked behind him. He had cast away his axe, and was therefore unarmed, but was lightened for the race. "'A sovereign to the man who catches him!' yelled Pepperill. "'Knock him down! Brain him!' Then one man heaved a stone, picked out of the river, and threw it. A vain attempt. He was not within reach of Redmore, but in pursuit, none can quite consider what is possible, and measure distances with nicety, without much greater coolness than is possessed by men running and leaping over difficult ground. The long-legged man kept forging ahead, with his elbows close to his sides. He had distanced the rest. He was fleet of foot, he sprang from stone to stone without pausing to consider, and without ever missing his footing. Roger advanced slowly. He was unaccustomed to such difficult ground. Sometimes he fell. He floundered into the river up to his armpits and scrambled out with difficulty. His pursuer never got into the water. The man had not merely long legs. He had a long nose and protruding eyes, and as he ran, with his elbows back, he held his forefingers extended the rest folded. Every stride brought him nearer to Redmore, and Roger, who had just scrambled upon a rock in the river, saw that he must be overtaken, and he prepared for the inevitable struggle. Kate, leaning forward in her eagerness, at this moment displaced a large block that slid down, turned on its edge and rolled, then leaped and bounded high into the air, crashed down on another rock, and from it leaped again in its headlong course. The girl held her breath. It seemed as though the rock must strike the running pursuer, and if it struck him it would inevitably be his death. The rattle of displaced stones, the crash of the block as it struck, the cries of those behind, who saw the danger, arrested the long-legged man. He halted and looked up and around, and at that moment the stone whizzed past and plunged into the river. Kate saw in a moment the advantage thus gained and in palpitating haste threw down every stone she could reach or tilt over from its resting place, where nicely balanced, thus sending a succession of volleys of leaping, whistling stones across the path between the pursued and the pursuers. She heard shouts and execrations from those who were coming up, and who stood still, not daring to continue their course and run the risk of having their brains beaten out by one of the falling stones. She regarded them not. Her one idea was to save Roger. She could see that the man for whom she acted had recognized her intervention and continued his flight. She could see that the pursuers were stationary, uncertain what to do. Then her uncle again raised his gun. Kate put her hands to her mouth and called to Roger, who looked over his shoulder and dropped behind a stone just as the gun was discharged. Then he picked himself up once more and ran on. Kate dared not desist. She continued to send block after block rolling. Some were shattered in their descent, and resolved themselves into a cloud of whizzing projectiles. Some, in striking the soil, set a mass of rubble in motion that shot down and threw up a cloud of dust. She was hot, weary, her hands wounded, but the consciousness of success strung her to renewed exertions. 
Pasco Pepperell called the party in pursuit together. He shouted up the height to the girl. Who it was there engaged in dislodging stones he couldn't discern, for Kate kept herself concealed as far as possible, and the confusion of the granite rocks, thrown into heaps and dislocated, served to disguise the presence of any one among them. He threatened, but threatened in vain. Kitty did not stay her hand to give time to listen to what he cried. After a brief consultation, as the avalanche did not decrease, the party resolved to cross the river and continue the pursuit down it on the farther side, through the smoke and over the ashes of the conflagration. By this means, Roger Redmore could be kept in sight, and possibly it would be more easy to run over the charred soil among bushes reduced to ash. Moreover, few, if any, of the stones dislodged by Kate had sufficient weight and velocity to carry them to the farther side of the river. Accordingly, the party began to step on the rocks that projected from the water, or to wade, so as to reach the farther side, Pepperell lingering behind, reloading his gun, and keeping his eye on the fugitive. Then a sudden idea struck him, and, calling to the men to proceed as they had proposed, he started to climb the steep side of Sharpator, at a point where not menaced by the falling stones, judging that by this means he would dislodge the person who had come to the assistance of the fugitive, and at the same time be able to follow the flight of the latter with his eye better than below, and to obtain a more leisurely shot at him when suitable occasion offered, as his poising himself on a rock, or halting to resolve on his course. Kate desisted from sending down volleys of stones, till the occasion should arise again. She watched the flight of Roger, and perceived that he was aiming at a coppice which was in a fold of the hills, undiscernible by those on the farther side of the river. By means of this coppice, if he could reach it, Roger would be able to effect his escape. In three minutes he was safe. Then Kate drew a long breath. At the same moment she was touched on the shoulder, and, looking round, saw her father. "'What's all this about? What's this shouting and firing of guns?' "'Oh, father, I hope I have not done wrong. Uncle and all the men are after Roger Redmore.' "'Who is he?' "'The man who burnt Mr. Pook's ricks. And he has been working for you here. And uncle recognized him, and sent the men to take him. And he ran away, and I have helped him.' "'You?' "'Yes.' by rolling down rocks. Jason burst into a fit of laughter. Come, that is fine. You and I, Kitty, aiders and abettors of an incendiary. Is he clear off now? Yes, but here comes uncle up the steep side. Jason hobbled to the edge of the rock, and leaning over called, Halloo, Pasco! Here we are waiting for you. Kitty alone and I... End of chapter 22